I'm uh, very pleased to welcome folks, uh, both uh, in person for our uh, small audience here. We appreciate you joining us uh, in person in the uh, moot court room here at the S.J. Quinney College of Law uh, and for the uh, 160 uh, folks uh, who are online uh, joining us uh, for uh, this uh, second uh, Wallace Stegner Center uh, Green Bag event uh, of the fall uh, 2021 academic year. Uh, I'm Bob Keiter, uh, Director of the uh, Wallace Stegner Center for Land Resources and the Environment at the S.J. Quinney College of Law at the University of Utah. Uh, we're pleased uh, to be able to bring uh, today's program uh, to you uh, live uh, and uh, via Zoom. Uh, for those who are here with us in person, we regret that uh, we're not able to provide food, uh, as I'm sure you're all aware. Uh, there are severe restrictions on that uh, with the ongoing uh, COVID-related uh, pandemic. Uh, to begin, uh, since we are here on site, we acknowledge that this land, which is named for the Ute tribe, is the traditional and ancestral homeland of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshute, and Ute tribes. The University of Utah recognizes and respects the enduring relationship that exists between many indigenous peoples and their traditional homelands. We respect the sovereign relationship between tribes, states, and the federal government, and we affirm the University of Utah's commitment to a partnership with Native nations and urban Indian communities through research, education, and outreach activities. Uh, let me take a moment to, to just mention upcoming events. On November 4th, uh, we will host our third uh, Stegner Center Green Bag. Uh, the topic is United Nations Sustainability Development Goals, Forward Thinking for a Just and Equitable Future. Uh, you can see some connections between today's program and uh, this upcoming program. Presenters uh, will be three, uh, all professors here at the S.J. Quinney College of Law, Professor Bob Adler, uh, Professor Erica George, and Dean Elizabeth Cronk uh, Warner. Uh, all contributed chapters uh, to a book on this topic, and they will be addressing uh, the topic of uh, sustainability development goals uh, from the perspective of their contributions to the book. On November 17th, the Stegner Center is honored uh, to uh, host uh, virtually, uh, our 18th young scholar, young Stegner Center scholar, uh, and that is Etienne Toussaint, an assistant professor of law at the University of South Carolina, uh, who will be addressing uh, the topic of the indignity of food insecurity. And then on March 17th and 18th, uh, we will be host uh, in conjunction with the Water and Tribes Initiative the 27th Annual Stegner Center Symposium, the Colorado River Compact, Navigating the Future. Uh, this uh, is uh, timed to coincide with the Colorado River Compact's 2020, uh, 2022 100-year centennial. Uh, we'll reflect on the past century of water management and envision our common future regarding the river and strategies to share water, engage tribes, integrate environmental consideration, and adapt to climate change. More information is available at the Stegner Center website on our calendar of events. Uh, now it's my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, James uh, Jimmy May, uh, who is a visiting uh, professor uh, this semester <clears throat> at the S.J. Quinney College of Law, uh, at his home institution, Widener University, Delaware School of Law. Uh, he is a distinguished professor of law, founder of the Global Environmental Rights Institute, and co-founder of the Dignity Rights Project. Uh, in addition, uh, Jimmy serves as a board member of the Normandy Chair for Peace 
the Earth Law Center, and Delaware Green Watch. Uh, he also uh, has served in a number of capacities with the American Bar Association and other uh, environmental uh, law related uh, organizations. His publication record is extensive. He has uh, over eight uh, books, including the forthcoming Environmental Human Rights in the Anthropocene uh, that is due out next year, the Dignity Law Handbook, the Dignity Law Casebook on Constitution and Perspectives, uh, as well as a number of other books uh, on environmental constitutionalism. Uh, Professor May has received numerous awards and recognitions, including uh, from the American Bar Association, the Sierra Club, the American Canoe Association, Pace University Haub School of Law, and from his own uh, home uh, university. Law Dragon has recognized him as one of the world's most influential environmental lawyers. With that, we're pleased to have you with us today and this semester, Jimmy. And we look forward to your talk on the case for legal recognition of environmental human rights. Thank you for joining us today. I was told I can remove this. That's okay with you. Uh, well, good afternoon. And for those of you in virtual land, good evening or good morning, wherever you are. Uh, first, let me thank Professor Kider for that uh, very generous introduction. It's such a pleasure to be here at S.J. Quinney School of Law at the University of Utah and to be a part of the Wallace Stegner Center uh, for this semester. It's a beautiful campus, beautiful building. And for those of you who haven't now, I've visited here before, of course, the environs around here are really, at least in my experience, like none other. So I, I'm just enjoying myself so much, and it's, it's a pleasure and an honor to give this talk. Uh, I'm talking about, um, you know, nothing terribly uh, interesting or important to the world, which is just whether human beings have a right to a healthy environment. Uh, oh, do, raise your hand if you think that's important. Okay, thank you. I think we had one dissenter, but um, we can talk about that after the talk if you'd like. So there is a question about whether there is a right to a healthy environment and a question as to whether it's recognized in law. And so that's what I'll be talking about is, you know, the extent to which it's recognized, how it emerged, uh, whether it's making any difference and uh, some recent developments. So in other words, the case for legal recognition of environmental human rights, as it's known. Uh, so here's my overview, uh, first about what human rights uh, are in, to a healthy environment that is, and how they're recognized in law, uh, because they can be recognized in all sorts of ways, internationally, regionally, domestically, subnationally, and otherwise. To what extent they're enforced, because that's an entirely different question, just because there's a right doesn't necessarily mean there's a remedy. Uh, barring from John Marshall in Marbury versus Madison, actually reaching a different sort, kind of result. And to what extent uh, the, the effort to recognize the right to a healthy environment improves environmental outcomes. What difference does it make? That's the engineer in me. Uh, my uh, background is actually mechanical engineering. And so law school was extremely frustrating to me at the beginning because I was looking for answers. You know, what's the answer, prof? Uh, but what we learn in law is that it's not so much about the answer, it's about the conversation and the arguments that are made. And then the question ultimately is, does that conversation argument lead to improved results? It's a tough nut to crack when we're talking about rights, oftentimes. Uh, and then are there alternatives to recognition of an environmental human right to kind of reach the same type of outcome? Uh, and we'll talk about that, like rights to health or life or dignity. And then what's new? You know, what's new? What difference does all this conversation make? You know, what's happening, uh, wait for it, today? What's happening later this week? And what's happening next month on the environmental human rights front? There's a lot. And then we'll have time for conversation. Uh, I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts about all of this. So what's the first footing on environmental human rights? So uh, I have to say, it, it, you know, anything is arguable, but arguably the, the first legal recognition of something akin to a right to a healthy environment is the Magna Carta. Yes, the Magna Carta. Uh, 
you know, going back 800 years to um, 1215 and the companion forest principles, which recognized the right to healthy forests. So that provides, if you will, kind of a footing to this idea that um, you know, there's nothing new under the sun, including with environmental human rights. Uh, as a legal ideal, however, it, it, it's, it took a long time for environmental human rights to sort of enter the firmament of human rights speak. The first country to consider amending its constitution or amending or any, at any governmental level to amend a constitution to recognize a right to a healthy environment is yes, yours and mine, you know, none other than the United States. Uh, now, this quote here that you see on the screen is actually from uh, who, someone who was at the, at the time a young congressperson representing Westchester County, New York, uh, Richard Ottinger. You, know, you might know him as Professor Richard Ottinger from Pace, who proposed a constitutional amendment in 1968. Yes, the year of the White Album. He proposed to, yes, that, that, that's your obligatory Beatles reference, to amend the U.S. Constitution to recognize a decent environment. Um, it didn't happen. It helped, however, provide an impetus for the National Environmental Policy Act, which is the, na the nation's environmental planning statute. But at the subnational level, uh, things took off. So first in 1970, Illinois, the Illini, fighting Illini, became the very first state, uh, the very first government anywhere on the planet to constitutionally incorporate a right to a healthy environment. Illinois, the land of Lincoln. And then soon thereafter, by something like a referendum, Pennsylvania adopted a provision in 1971, followed by Massachusetts and Montana in 1972, and Hawaii in 1978. So there we see this you know, incredible amount of attention on recognizing the right to a healthy environment uh, a very, very long time ago, you know, almost 50 years ago. So, it, you know, what's happened really in that last, in the next uh, half century? Um, I want to just focus on, on part of the answer to that question is looking at this provision from the Pennsylvania Constitution, which recognizes that the people have a right to clean air, pure water, and to the preservation of the natural, scenic, historic, and aesthetic values of the environment. It also says that Pennsylvania serves as trustee for resources of the environment, a, a constitutional codification, if you will, of the public trust doctrine elsewhere. So this provision uh, sits and it waits and it's patient and it comes alive, but not for another 40 years. More on that in a moment. Subnational recognition isn't, doesn't, didn't only happen in the United States. This is just a sampling of the states in Brazil that have constitutional provisions that recognize a right to a healthy environment, where 25 out of the 26 states of Brazil do so. Around the same time, there was an international emergence of this idea of an environmental human right, of recognizing it, beginning with the Stockholm Declaration that declared that man has a fundamental right to freedom, equality, and adequate conditions of life in an, in an environment of equality that permits a life of dignity and well-being. And that's from 1972. So, you know, we're, we're looking at a half a century ago that uh, and, and next year we'll celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Stockholm Declaration, but this is principle one. This is from the start. And this is the idea. Uh, the Stockholm Declaration was sponsored, the conversation was sponsored by the United Nations and the UN General Assembly. And the UN Charter uh, it has twin purposes. First, you know, to address the scourge of war, if you will. And secondly, to promote human dignity. So we see that here in the Stockholm Declaration. But the emergence of a right to a healthy environment uh, took some time at the international level. There isn't an international treaty that recognizes it. Most multilateral environmental agreements hardly make mention of it. But we, you know, there are some exceptions like the Hague Convention that you see on the, the, the slides or the screen in front of you, um, uh, the Rio Declaration, uh, 
makes a passing reference, uh, kind of encapsulating this idea of a right to a healthy environment. But we don't see it in modern manifestations of you know how to address uh, the Anthropocene or climate change, like in the Paris Climate Agreement, which talks about human rights, but not environmental human rights. So there's a question as to what role can international law play in this recognition? More on that in a few minutes. Uh, there has been a lot more regional acceptance of the right to a healthy environment, in including in the San Salvador Protocol, the um, African Charter on Human and People's Rights, the Arab Charter on Human Rights, uh, the Asian uh, Convention on Human Rights, and then in uh, two treaties, uh, regional treaties that address the rights to information, participation, and access to justice in environmental matters. That's the Aarhus Convention and the Eskazu Agreement. Uh, recognize a right to a healthy environment. And then more and more we're seeing recognition out of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights of this linkage between human rights and a healthy environment. Next, you might be wondering, well, what about at the national level? What's happened with environmental human rights? Uh, well, depending upon um, uh, what your source is, uh, some might say that the first constitution, some have said that the first constitution to um, recognize a right to a healthy environment and embody it was Yugoslavia. But because Yugoslavia is no longer a country, that, uh, that uh, distinction now goes to Portugal, which is the first country to recognize a right to a healthy environment. That's in 1976 in this, and this very you know, efficient and economical language that everyone shall possess the right to a healthy and ecologically balanced human living environment and the duty to defend it, sort of that reciprocal obligation. Uh, one of my favorite exemplars of how environmental human rights have been incorporated in constitutions across the globe is from South Africa. And I won't read all of it, but uh, this is Article 24 that guarantees that everyone has a right to an environment that is not harmful to their health or well-being. These days, as of September 23rd, 2021, by my count, there are 83 countries that expressly instantiate a right to a healthy environment. So that's what this is a depiction of, just to give you a sense of that. It's expressed substantive recognition throughout the world, including at the subnational or provincial levels. This is a um, uh, from actually the environmental rights map, uh, which uh, was founded by Josh Gellers and uh, something that we've worked on for about the last eight years in developing a map that gives you all the language uh, uh, for substantive provisions, right to nature, procedural rights for any, uh, any uh, nation across the globe and also at the subnational level. So if you're curious, like, for example, whether, you know, to the extent to which the Constitution of Utah uh, addresses a right to a healthy environment, you could just type in Utah on this map. It would come up nil, but you could search anywhere you'd like. Now, recognition can occur in other ways than through express constitutional recognition. The, the way that dates back now almost 40 years is by uh, in, implicitly interpreting uh, rights to life, health, and dignity as incorporating in a, implicitly a right to a healthy environment. The leading cases come from India and Bangladesh and Pakistan and Panama and Sri Lanka and Guatemala. So these are situations where courts have turned to constitutionally protected rights like, like to dignity and construed those provisions as reflecting and respecting a right to a healthy environment. Another way in which countries can recognize rights to healthy environments, uh, substance, substantive rights, is legislatively. So there are about 23 countries, in addition to those who have recognized a right to a healthy environment constitutionally, that recognize a right to a healthy environment legislatively. So there's not a constitutional provision, but there are uh, there, uh, provisions that have been enacted legislatively. And then again, by my count, there are 23 other countries that 
legally recognize a right to a healthy environment in some sort of enforceable way. Those are the countries that have signed on to the African Charter on Peoples and Human Rights. Why? How is that different than the other regional agreements? Be because it's enforceable. So that uh, is a proxy for substantive recognition. So by my count, about 135 countries across the globe out of 193, maybe 90, 192, again, depending upon how you count it uh, with regard to what's happening in Afghanistan, uh, about 135 recognize a, a substantive right to a healthy environment in some way, shape, or form. So that's what this map is. Uh, this was a map that was produced by the Environmental Law Institute in conjunction with the Environmental Rights Initiative of the United Nations Environment Program through its Environmental Rule of Law report from 2019. I know that's a mouthful. The other way in which rights can be recognized uh, ultimately and implemented is judicially. So you may be wondering, okay, so there are there's international recognition, regional recognition, subnational, national. Well, what difference does it make? To what extent are courts paying attention to it? Uh, and uh, Aaron Daly, my colleague in crime on much of this work, and I published an article in 2009 that surveyed uh, and examined all the court cases concerning a right to a healthy environment. Uh, and it, it, wasn't, uh, it was pretty thin soup at the time, and we were exploring why that might be. And not much has changed when it comes to recognition and implementation of an express right to a healthy environment. Uh, courts are reluctant uh, to engage these provisions, or at least have been reluctant to engage these provisions. Uh, there is more activity uh, uh, fairly recently, but again, it's a work in progress. So the extent to which courts are trying to implement an express provision. Again, it's thin soup. There's not, there aren't many cases. Some of the leading cases are out of Pennsylvania, uh, the Philippines, South Africa, and, and Argentina, where courts have reached the merits. Again, it's, it, it's fairly rare, but uh, have actually applied these provisions uh, to a fact pattern and then reaching some sort of a remedy. Uh, or a consent decree or a court order. Uh, there are a few cases. Pennsylvania is one of the leading uh, jurisdictions to do that. In some places where environmental rights provisions have been tested, courts have yet to apply them, have, you know, have yet to uphold them and implement an order and so on. Uh, a recent case out of Norway is, is an example of that. There's far more jurisprudence on the other side of the human rights shop jurisprudentially on the implicit side. There are far more cases where courts are construing rights to life, health, dignity, and other socioeconomic rights in the furtherance of what we might think of as a right to a healthy environment. Um, leading cases, as I mentioned earlier, come from India and Pakistan and Bangladesh. Some of the earliest cases uh, came from India, cases brought by MC Mehta. Uh, some recent examples out of Pakistan have come from the Lahore High Court, which is kind of the, the, the leading provincial jurisdiction in Pakistan, where uh, the courts there have applied the right to dignity that's recognized in Article 14 of the Pakistani Constitution to uphold rights to a healthy environment. and to um, require the government to implement climate change strategies. So yeah, under a right to dignity, not under a right to a healthy environment. So um, there may be, you may wonder you know, why there are so you know, few cases uh, uh, going back uh, through the, the, the litany of, of years, you know, all the way back to the beginning of thinking about this in 19, 68 and so on. Well, well, there are a few apex courts that have reached or applied these provisions. Those are courts that issue controlling decisions or decisions that are precedential. And then some courts are reluctant to uh, recognize an implied right as well. There's a recent case out of Ireland where the Supreme Court of Ireland was just unwilling to recognize an unenumerated right to a healthy environment derived from a right to dignity. So there are counterexamples. examples. 
Thank you again for the water. And so um, that all warrants um, additional study. <clears throat> Uh, an exemplar of the role that courts can play and that judges can play in transforming rights in general and environmental human rights in particular comes from Pennsylvania. If you recall, Pennsylvania was the second state to instantiate a right to a healthy environment in 1971. And as I mentioned, that provision kind of sat in desuetude, kind of waiting for an opportunity. And courts in Pennsylvania were really reluctant to recognize it as a self-enforcing, self-executing um, right that could be uh, enforced in court. Well, until 2013, so enacted in 1971, sits in desuetude, kind of waits patiently, and then springs to life in 2013. We're in a plurality opinion. Uh, Justice Castile, on his way out as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania, uh, wrote that this provision means something. It's on par with other constitutional rights. It's in the fundamental rights portion of the Pennsylvania Constitution, and it can be enforced. It doesn't need an act of the legislature. Um, it's, it's actionable in that parties have standing, and it doesn't present a political question. You know, It just sweeps away all those obstacles in upholding this right where he writes, the plain meaning of the terms conserve and maintain implicates a duty to prevent and remedy the degradation, diminution, or depletion of our public natural resources. Now, a few years after that, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court issued a majority opinion, uh, at least on the law, also finding the provision to be self-executing and actionable. Uh, so it is the law of the land in Pennsylvania, and it's been used to change outcomes. For example, in striking down what was known as Act 13, which encouraged fracking in Pennsylvania, and the court finding that, that provisions of that were violative of the Pennsylvania Environmental Rights Amendment. So you may wonder, well, why aren't there more rights to a healthy environment cases? Um, well, many of these provisions, first and foremost, um, aren't self-executing. Many of the provisions that I mentioned earlier, for example, of the 83 countries that recognize a right to a healthy environment, uh, uh, less than half are found in the Bill of Rights or the fundamental rights portion of the Constitution. That is where it can be um, used in the court case, if you will, with direct action. That doesn't have to go through the legislature or some other entity or an alms buds person or what have you. So that's one challenge. But even in those countries where an environmental human right appears in the Bill of Rights provision and otherwise looks to be potentially enforceable, there are all sorts of procedural obstacles. Those of you who are litigators or soon to be litigators know these very, very well. At the top of the list is standing, where it's um, you know, some environmental exports from the United States, I think, uh, you know, have left a positive mark on the world, like the National Environmental Policy Act, you know, one of the nation's most successful legislative exports ever. Well, then there's the standing doctrine. And that's, you know, the outcome there is sort of in the opposite direction where, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's invented, it's used as a means of keeping people out of court in the United States, you know, under the auspices of the case or controversy clause. And it's been adopted in a lot of places, kind of similar reasoning uh, to prevent the pursuit of environmental cases, including rights-based cases. And then there are cases about jurisdiction. Uh, that is, which court can hear the matter? Uh, and the jurisdictional questions can come up in a variety of ways. You know, courts, uh, the extent to which courts are competent, that's the language of jurisdiction in many, in many places, and that is that can hear uh, cases, is up to the law of that particular nation, is up to the, you know, the Constitution or the, the legislative acts to give courts power. So legislatures giveth and legislatures you know, can take it away, you can limit the jurisdiction of courts or, or um, prohibit courts from hearing rights-based claims, uh, uh, including about the environment. So there can be jurisdictional limits. There can also be jurisdictional limits about you know, personal jurisdiction, the kinds of things that uh, come up in a course on civil procedure. Uh, and recent cases that involve removal and venue and form nonconvenience and a whole variety of doctrines that can keep uh, uh, courts from reaching the merits. And there's also separation of powers issues. 
know, if you're a judge and if you're upholding a right, what does that mean? You know, what does that mean for the government and how can you enforce that? It's one thing to uphold an act of the legislature because the legislature is behind it. It's another thing to recognize a new right. And then again, what to do if the government doesn't enforce it. And also reluctance uh, to be seen as being activist as well, uh, which can foment political uh, consequences along the way. So there are challenges to the to enforcing rights in general and environmental rights in particular. Another reason is just language. You know, the limits of this technology that we use, we call language. What's the environment? Everything? Are we in the environment now? <laughs> is it um, nature? Is, does it include air, water, land, biodiversity? I could go on. Is there any limiting feature there? So the law looks for limiting features, as judges do, right? So there are questions about that. And there are also questions about the adjectives and not just the noun, right? What does it mean to have a healthy environment? Well, how do you know? And what's unhealthy? What's a sustainable environment? You know, how do you know? And maybe this will come up in the next green bag about the ESGs as well. Is what does sustainable sustainability mean? What is sustainable development? What's ecologically sustainable development? So when we apply that to rights, how do we do that? If we, you know, it's given the challenges of, of doing it in other settings as well. Um, what does it mean to have pure water, clean air? Again, I could go on. So we have these adjectives and they're well-intentioned and so on. But uh, when you try to litigate them, you know, it creates these other additional challenges. And the last challenge is just all of the energy and wherewithal it takes to, to litigate in general and litigate rights-based claims in particular. Um, you know, most of the time, this is work that doesn't pay, right? So there are challenges to enforcing environmental rights and all sorts of reasons they're not. The next question is, well, does legal recognition of a right to a healthy environment improve environmental outcomes? You know, what difference does it make to the climate, to air, water, species protection, um, and so on? You know, you know, protecting the Colorado River. Uh, there are cases there too. You know, to what extent do these sorts of rights make a difference? Well, the evidence that recognizing a right to a healthy environment in a constitution, for example, is, again, is fairly thin. There's, there's very little evidence that adoption of a constitutional amendment to recognize a right to a healthy environment causes improvements in environmental outcomes. Uh, is, uh, you know, there's a lot of work to be done there by social scientists and others, economists. There is some evidence, however, that embedding both substantive rights and procedural rights is positively associated. So that's different than causation. That's more like uh, correlation. But is positively associated with access to water sources and sanitation facilities. This is a, uh, a, what I believe to be a very important report um, from uh, doctors Jeffords and Gellers that was published a couple of years ago that analyzed the extent to which these provisions are changing environmental outcomes. Which brings me back to this again. So these are, you know, kind of a sampling of the world, a snapshot from Mars, if you will, but all the places around the globe that expressly or impliedly recognize a right to a healthy environment. And then compare it to this. So this is from the Yale um, uh, School of, of Law and the Environment, uh, and it, it, which issues a performance index. And the dark blue, uh, those are the countries that have a, uh, if you will, like a, the, the, the best um, performance looking at various environmental indicators. And then uh, down the scale, the lighter blue isn't as good. Lighter than that isn't as good as the light blue. Uh, the, the gray isn't as good as the, the lightest blue. And the white you know, has the lowest performance under the Yale performance, uh, environmental performance quality index. So again, if we compare that to that, it's almost inverted. 
that you know the, the, the where there's the you know um, the best environmental performance uh, in many places there there isn't recognition of a right to a healthy environment implicitly or explicitly. So last is what's new, right? With all of this, with a right to a healthy environment, what's going on today? And the what's going on part involves these different moving parts and facets, including what's going on internationally, regionally, nationally, and subnationally. Well, we see there's a lot, uh, including, yes, again today, day nine of the meeting of the uh, UN Human Rights Council in Geneva, where there's consideration of a political declaration that recognizes a right to a healthy environment. To, so that's under consideration. That would be a watershed event to do that. I think it will. I think the UN Human Rights Council is likely to adopt a political declaration that recognizes a right to a healthy environment. Then the question is what to do with that. Um, one route is to go to the UN General Assembly with it to get UN General Assembly recognition of a resolution of, of the right of uh, to a healthy environment. So that's happening again today and for the next uh, week and a half. Consideration of whether to adopt a right to a healthy environment. So look, there are all sorts of other things happening too, all sorts of other things on the human rights agenda for the UN Human Rights Council. You know, starvation in East Africa, what's you know, uh, political turmoil in various places around the globe. So it isn't the only item on the agenda, but it is one of them. Also, next week, uh, just about, you know, if you give me the extra day, a week from today, a week from yesterday, uh, there is a proposal to add a protocol to the European Convention on Human Rights. So about, well, about 10 slides ago, I showed you regional agreements where there's acknowledgement of a right to a healthy environment. And on that list, we didn't see the European Convention on Human Rights. It's because it's the only principal human rights accord in the world that doesn't recognize a right to a healthy environment. Now that's a little bit of an exaggeration because uh, the European Court of Human Rights in applying the European Convention on Human Rights has recognized something akin to a right to a healthy environment, but through other provisions like a right to family and a right to life. But what there is now is a, a, another push, a new push for uh, amending, if you will, the European Convention so that it recognizes a right to a healthy environment in particular. And then all the signatories to the European Convention on Human Rights would be bound by that and litigants would be uh, permitted to appeal, express claims that uh, violations of a, a right to a healthy environment before the European Court. So that's under consideration. That hasn't happened, but it's in the it's in process again, and we'll see where it goes. And then at the subnational level, in the United States, there's been an awful lot of activity over the last five years for statewide recognition of a right to a healthy environment. The so-called uh, constitutional greening movement or green constitutionalism. Uh, New York, just in a couple of months, about two months from now, from today, uh, will vote on whether to amend its constitution to uh, afford a right to a healthy environment through this language, to recognize that each person shall have a right to clean air and water and a healthful environment. So we'll know in two months whether that carries and New York's constitution is amended to recognize that right so that New York becomes the sixth state to do so by my count. But that's not all. There are very serious conversations in states in the north in the south and east and the west, blue states, red states, purple states, uh, to consider um, constitutional amendments recognizing a right to a healthy environment it's in Kentucky, Maine, Maryland, New Mexico, Oregon, Washington, West Virginia, and at one point in time, about five years ago, 
Delaware, but not right now. And then there's this sort of um, elephant in the room about what all this means for climate change. You know, if there's recognition of a right to a healthy environment, what does that do? How does that inform? How does that change? What does that contribute to conversations about climate change? Well, by my count, nine countries constitutionally instantiate climate change in some way in their constitutions and by requiring the government to develop greenhouse gas reduction programs or what have you. Tunisia is an example. Uh, so th there's also been linkage between um, human rights and, and climate at the regional level and uh, sort of, you know, most uh, impressively by the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. There are a few cases, however, outside of those realms that link human rights in the environment and climate. Uh, there are some exceptions, as I mentioned earlier, uh, from Pakistan. Uh, about um, uh, 17 years ago, there was a case in Nigeria that linked human rights and a healthy environment and climate change. And more recently, and again, we could list dozens here, uh, litigants are using the law in new and creative and interesting ways to try to get to climate change. You know, a leading example of that is the Juliana case out of the United States District Court for the District of Oregon, the Ninth Circuit, the U.S. Supreme Court, 60 Minutes, and all sorts of other places. But the theory that's being um, uh, pursued in that case is that the Due Process Clause of the United States Constitution can accommodate recognizing a right to a stable climate as a human right, as a fundamental right, uh, under the U.S. Constitution. So that's on uh, that's present. That's a case that's gone up and down, dismissed by the Ninth Circuit on standing ground, and then the plaintiffs filed a motion to amend their complaint under Rule 15. There was a hearing six weeks ago or so. And the judge, Judge Aiken, hasn't ruled on that one yet. But there we see, again, this attempt to breathe life into this idea that you and the people you care about and everyone on the planet has a right to a healthy environment. So four conclusions. Uh, and then time for questions. So the first is that while the case for a right to a healthy environment is solid, an international, regional, domestic, subnational law, in, and to some extent in court cases, it has these shortcomings that warrant further evidence-based analytical interpretation and judicial training. What I mean by that is twofold. First, for there to be, <clears throat> pardon me, more studies about examining the extent to which these provisions make a difference and why. And secondly, and what I think is most important, is judicial training. Uh, to get before judges and to talk about what these, the work that these provisions can do, the difference that these provisions can make all around the globe. The United Nations uh, Environmental Rights Initiative uh, uh, operating out of Nairobi uh, and UNEA, United Nations Environmental Assembly, has a judicial training program uh, that I've been a part of. And the objective is to do just that, to begin with a few opinions that change the conversation and illuminate and animate um, outcomes going forward. Second is that there are good practices uh, that, you know, that, that offer a measure of hope right now. Uh, in, as we turn to instantiating environmental provisions, some good uh, uh, practices including, include pardon me, having an objective, like you know, what environment, what's healthy, what are we getting to? Um, some constitutions do that specifically. Like the Constitution of Bhutan uh, requires that uh, 60 some odd percent of all land remain forested. It's in the Constitution. Um, and the Constitution of Kenya, that no more than 10 percent of uh, land uh, not be forested. So that's an objective. Also, clear text, a right to you know, clean air, clean water, and so on. Um, at least the Pennsylvania. Constitution would suggest that that approach is more likely to yield uh, judicial uh, uh, vindication and acceptance than generalized provisions.
Self-execution, that is putting the provision in the Bill of Rights or the fundamental rights portion of a constitution makes it more likely to be enforced. Also scaffolding with other rights, including access to information and participation and justice, like what studies have shown that if putting those, linking those together uh, can improve environmental outcomes because both you have a better conversation and you have a better consequence. And most importantly, you know, judicial and legislative engagement along the way. You know, that legislatures can identify rights as well. It doesn't have to wait for a constitutional um, uh, amendment or convention. The third conclusion is that we already have some tools at our disposal to further environmental outcomes in the furtherance of recognizing a right to a healthy environment, mostly through other socioeconomic rights, like a right to health or dignity or life. The leading cases and most of the cases in the environmental rights over come from there. And that's for good reason. There's a longer history of, of implementing those provisions. Judges tend to be more comfortable with what it means to have a right to life or health or dignity than a right to the environment, at least now. So those provisions can be put into place and in play uh, without delay. And fourth is that all of this effort is for good reason. That international efforts, regional, national, and subnational recognition can help to redress these shortcomings, realize potential, and catalyze the cause. So it's all good. So there you go. That's the case for legal recognition of a right to a healthy environment. Love to hear your thoughts. Bob, do I just stay here? One second. Uh, let me, uh, this is on, right? Yeah. Let me remind folks that uh, there's the opportunity to uh, ask uh, Professor May questions uh, through our uh, Slido um, app. Uh, we do have a couple of questions that have come in uh, during the course of uh, the talk. Uh, the information about uh, Slido.com uh, uh, and the code uh, is uh, now uh, posted um, uh, in front of us. Uh, our colleague, uh, Bob Adler, uh, who practiced in the jurisdiction of Pennsylvania uh, as a young lawyer, uh, notes that uh, uh, the Pennsylvania constitutional provision that you mentioned uh, was uh, viewed as a quiescent, if not meaningless, uh, for decades, and then came to life uh, in the Robinson Township case. What do you think explains that resurrection uh, the timing of the litigation, the justices, the case, or something else? Um, and first of all, thank you for the question, Bob. Uh, yeah, it was quiescent. Uh, there were some cases applying it for whatever that's worth, primarily brought by the Attorney General for the state of Pennsylvania, and then courts in Pennsylvania had to decide whether it was self-executing or the legislature had to get involved, and it was kind of a mess. and. And there was a, a case that ruled that to apply that provision, uh, uh, you had to go through something akin to intermediate scrutiny, not strict scrutiny. But um, I brought my first claim under that provision in 1998 in a water quality and endangered species case, and I couldn't get the court's attention at all. It was a federal judge, right? <laughs> but I still couldn't. I brought it as a supplemental claim to, based on federal question jurisdiction. So Bob's right. It just sat there. So I don't know, you know, life is complicated, cases are complicated, but here's my best guess. And I wonder if Bob, you know, if you agree with this, I'm curious, but I think it really came down to Justice Castile. So Franklin Curry, who was the originator of that provision, uh, be, you know, when he was a very young uh, uh, assembly person in Pennsylvania and still in his 20s, uh, he's still alive now. He's just written a book about his experience, and he, he thinks that Justice Castile had a lot to do with it. That, again, he was looking, he was soon to be retiring, uh, 
and he loves Pennsylvania and he's an outdoors person and he's he's uh, appreciates natural resources and um, and it was he viewed that provision as a creed of core in, in protecting the environment in Pennsylvania and so again nearly on his way out he writes this opinion he gets three other justices to to go along um, well kind of <laughs> and and changes the law and since this case since the Robinson Township case and then the subsequent case in Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund which was a majority opinion recognizing that the provision is enforceable and um, self-executing and on par with other socioeconomic rights there are dozens and dozens of cases that have been filed in Pennsylvania uh, to protect the environment water quality air quality um, uh, protecting land and to promote environmental justice and also to make sure that governmental programs are used in the furtherance of conservation instead of to offset uh, general budgetary needs for the state of Pennsylvania. So it's been, um, by, my, by my count, again, you know, reasonable minds can disagree and I respect the disagreement. By my count, it's been the most influential constitutional provision in the world uh, because of all these cases. And, and the difference it's made. It shows the potential of these sorts of provisions. Thank you for the question. Let me follow up on that, uh, because uh, uh, you've mentioned um, uh, the problems getting into court. Uh, and then in discussing Robinson Township, you've mentioned enforcement uh, of the provision. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit further on, you know, sort of what the courts are doing at the, at the back end, uh, how they're going about uh, taking this language and uh, fashioning uh, meaningful relief that is indeed uh, sensitive to, uh, protective of uh, the environment. Yeah, that's a, thank you, that's a great question. And let me lower your expectations. There are a lot of cases, there aren't many orders yet. So a lot of them are in the pipeline uh, about the things that I mentioned. But the Robinson Township case and the Community Environmental Legal Defense case are two cases where the court reached the merits and uh, issued a remedy and it made a difference. So the, in the Robinson Township case, uh, that was the fracking case where the legislature, as I mentioned earlier, uh, enacted a law that um, made it really hard for municipalities to ban fracking. And it made it so that fracking had this presumption, if you will, um, of feasibility and going forward and changing setback laws and other things anyway, but it was, it was pro-fracking, okay? So the, uh, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court then reviews this law and decides that it's unconstitutional under the Pennsylvania Right to a Healthy Environment Provision, Environmental Rights Amendment, and that stops Act 13, it was called, the, in its place. Um, so there are still some parts of it that went into effect but the overall scheme of turning Pennsylvania into a fracking factory was abandoned because of a lawsuit, because of a judge, a justice. The Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund is another example, Bob, <clears throat> of, a, of actual difference making, where Pennsylvania was using uh, funds from royalties uh, uh, for oil and gas mining on state lands. Uh, not for intended purposes. So the state was using uh, those royalties and taxes uh, to really to, to satisfy the state debt and to direct it to other state programs. So the, the plaintiffs brought a lawsuit challenging that as violating um, this uh, Article 27 of the Pennsylvania Constitution and won. You know, that's the one where it went all the way to the Supreme Court. So that's another example of it changing uh, outcomes. So those funds, and we're not talking about, the, you know, the, the few coins that are in my pocket or anything. We're talking about tens of millions of dollars. Instead of going to the general treasury for the state of Pennsylvania, go to the state Department of Natural Resources and go for conservation uh, and restoration uh, of, um, you know, of natural resources in Pennsylvania. You know, another remedy from the constitutional provision that's made a real difference. Great, thank you. Uh, we've uh, gotten in a few more questions. Uh, let me uh, try to run through them. I've got uh, at least uh, four in front of me, so we want to 
be relatively brief in responding, but uh, I think appropriate to uh, get some uh, answers. Uh, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child grant young people specific rights to a healthy environment. What legal efforts are underway across the U.S. to <coughs> achieve uh, the environmental rights uh, do today's uh, youth and future generations. Oh gosh, that's a, yeah, Bob, that's a that's a two hour long conversation at least, but at the international level, there have been petitions filed with um, the, the, the UN uh, entity that hears, uh, that uh, implements and enforces uh, the Rights of the Child Convention. Um, so uh, like a case was brought last year by uh, Greta Thunberg and others on, on behalf of a few nations um, that raises the, just those kinds of claims, uh, but in the but in the U.S., you know, we don't enforce that. That's that doesn't that international court has not had, had much of an uh, impact on this kind of um, uh, the, these pursuits of a right to a healthy environment, including for future generations. But it's a great question. Uh, some countries have established standing for trees and water uh, animals, etc. Yep. Uh, how do these statutes or constitutional provisions interact with the right to a healthy environment? Another great, another great question. The short answer is not much. Uh, Ecuador is the only country on the planet to recognize the rights of nature through this concept known as Pachamama. Then some other nations have done so statutorily, including Bolivia and New Zealand. Some nations have uh, recognized uh, legal personification or legal personality, pardon me, of nature, you know, trees and glaciers and river systems, including in India, although those cases were reversed on appeal before the Supreme Court, uh, but also in Colombia, in the uh, River Atrato, the Rio Atrato case, uh, for, the, for the River Atrato, there's been progress there. But the international conversations in particular about a right to a healthy environment largely don't involve other conversations that are occurring about um, recognition of harmony of nature or rights of nature. So those are still like at a dinner party. Those are conversations that are happening at, at different tables, but perhaps at the same dinner party. And you know, over time, I think that they'll probably get together. Uh, moving from uh, Pennsylvania to Montana, uh, could you comment on the Montana Constitution? Uh, Article uh, 2 in the Declaration of Rights, uh, Section 3, about inalienable rights, uh, where there's a statement uh, about uh, the right to a clean and healthful environment. Uh, has that had any uh, meaningful impact? Well, another good question. Uh, it has led to litigation. So Montana was one of the first states to embody a, a right to a healthy environment in its constitution. Uh, the cases that have followed have been controversial. And the Montana legislature has regularly um, uh, contemplated uh, uh, tearing that provision out of the Montana Constitution. So as far as case law goes, we don't have the, for Montana, we don't have the litany of cases like we do out of Pennsylvania, uh, for example. So th I think there's more potential in Montana. Another provision in the Montana Constitution that can work in tandem, you know, for the person who asked this question, um, and this is just, you know, no extra charge, just by, you know, my opinion about it. Th there's another remarkable provision in the Montana Constitution, and the only one of its kind in any state in our country, which is a right to dignity. So Puerto the Puerto Rican Constitution has that, but Montana is the only state. So I'm still hoping for, or wondering about the first case that's brought to deploy the, both the right to dignity and the right to a healthy environment that's recognized in the Montana Constitution in furtherance of a right to a healthy environment. So I look forward to that. Bob, there was someone who raised a hand in the back. I don't know if you saw as well. I just wanted to mention that. The uh, Pennsylvania provision uh, makes reference to a, at least impliedly, a property right in public resources. Seems almost in addition to or separate and apart from a right to what we think of as individual rights, such as dignity or health. Do you, think, do you, do you agree that, that's, that you can see that in that provision? And if so, what are your thoughts about it? Okay, another great question. Um, 
the you know the Pennsylvania Constitution is it really is two pieces to it. The first piece is kind of what we thought of as a right to a healthy environment, right to clean air, clean water, that sort of thing. But the Robinson Township case and the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund case and many of these other cases are actually about the second clause of it that you're referring to, uh, the trusteeship clause. That and I don't I don't have the language on the screen, but that the state holds this land in trust for present and future generations, which raises all sorts of questions about what it means to hold something in trust. So my friend John Dernbach has written about this extensively, Professor Dernbach, about what that word means. That answer, I mean, it, it's it's a complicated answer to a great question. You know, do we mean private trust, traditional trusts? You know, what does it mean? What did the legislature mean in 1971 when it used that word? Because the meaning of the word has changed. So, so I, that's not a great answer to it, but uh, uh, but it's a great question. Raises another question that occurred to me: Is uh, are there some parallels uh, between uh, your argument for a constitutional right to a healthy environment uh, and uh, what we uh, know and several courts have recognized as a public trust doctrine? Uh, yeah. Could you sort of enlighten us on what parallels there are or not uh, between the two. <laughs> another great question. These are so easy. Um, just kidding. No, it's so. There are parallels with the public trust doctrine. The, the, I wouldn't even call it a parallel uh, as much as a consilience, first of all, which is that some constitutions recognize something akin to a public trust. So the public trust doctrine is largely a feature of common law. Um, so it's different from state to state, and it's different from state to state to the federal government. But by my count, again, this is by my count, about three dozen constitutions, three dozen countries, constitutionally recognize something akin to a public trust doctrine, something that Mary Wood and others would recognize as, hey, that's the public trust doctrine. It's just been constitutionalized. So that's, that's a consilience, maybe not so much of a parallel. The parallel I see is that, you know, like in the Juliana case, where it's hard to disassociate um, pushing for a right to a stable environment under the Constitution and the role and obligation of the government to hold uh, certain natural resources, arguably including the atmosphere, in trust. Now, Bob, the end of this, and I'll stop, is that you know courts have been really reluctant, as you know, to extend the public trust doctrine to resources outside of the water context. You know, that's a work in progress as well. So thank you for the question. One more question from our... Uh virtual viewers. Uh, the Biden administration has created an interagency national climate task force. Does this task force have a legal team that will address environmental rights as human rights in the climate uh, crisis context? Um, I, I, look, I'm not an expert on that particular commission, um, but I don't think so. I don't think that its charge is to consider environmental human rights per se, you know, as environmental human rights. You know, indirectly, could it? Sure. Um, it does have an obligation, however, it's supposed to consider environmental justice. So here's the link. Now, again, you may not agree with this. This, is, this might be a stretch. But it's supposed to take into account the environmental justice implications of national climate policies, okay? And so I argue that that includes a right to a healthy environment um, because environmental justice includes the recognition that everyone everywhere has a right to a healthy environment so that's just, that's not that isn't just from me what i just said uh, i'm paraphrasing from robert bullard who's largely you know viewed as the you know the parent of the modern environmental justice movement so i see connections there the second part of it um, bob is that, that i the question makes me think about goes back to the United Nations Human Rights Council and the conversations that are happening today about whether to recognize a right to a healthy environment. You guys did, you know, you know, the, the Human Rights Council, um, you know, just has, it has less than a couple of dozen members. The U.S. isn't one of them. But it still has a, you know, big loud voice and it opposes consideration of a right to a healthy environment. Or maybe not, maybe that's too much, maybe saying it opposes consideration or maybe it does, but it certainly opposes adoption or recognition of a right to a healthy environment. So getting back to the question about the Climate Council, if the Climate Council has to consider environmental justice, 
and the Biden administration has an obligation to abide by Executive Order 12898 on environmental justice, then um, it's the syllogism that uh, the United States should not be standing opposed to international recognition of a right to a healthy environment, because that's really a way of recognizing environmental justice. I don't know if you buy that, but that's, that's what I'm thinking about it. We greatly appreciate the connections that you have drawn, uh, both in international and domestic law, as well as common law, uh, and uh, giving us uh, some uh, hope that uh, if something is on the horizon with the concept of a right to a healthy environment. Uh, join me in thanking Professor Jimmy May uh, for his presentation, and please join us again in a few weeks uh, for our next uh, Green Bag. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone.